Okay. So. What is up with that? Oh, I can use the um. Okay. Um, so, the, the original idea of this talk was actually going to be much longer, um, and it was going to be entitled, How I Migrated from MySQL to Postgres, and That's Why I Lost All My Hair. Um, it didn't work. That didn't actually work, and it got really depressed that I was able to do it with a single command. Um, so, I kind of want to talk about PG Loader. So, PG Loader basically is, I like to think of it as like, um, uh, PG, um, PG loads on like steroids. Um, it could basically take almost anything that you need. Uh, let me see if I can show you the list of things they allow. <laughs> You can migrate from MySQL to Postgres. You can migrate from SQLite to Postgres. You can mi migrate Microsoft SQL Server to Postgres. You can do large CSV files, which is something I used it for when having um, a CSV file that was almost about, I think it was six gigabytes and included roughly, I think it was 200 columns. Um, it basically took a while, but it imported it fine and I was able to carry it. Um, the nice thing too is that any data that, that comes over comes over cleanly. Um, there are some minor issues where, as an example, integers, um, where uh, boole Boolean fields sometimes get shown up as integer values instead, but that's largely because the schema is specifying that. Um, yeah, it's really awesome. It, and I mean, legitimately, it is a single command that I ran and then waited five minutes and then was wondering why it only took 10 seconds to run. Um, I was migrating over, I think it was on the magnitude of 100,000 records in one day, in just one table. And there we go. <laughs> so yeah, basically it's just this. It's very actually nicely, I have to say the, the syntax of this is very clean and easy to understand. Um, it, it was very surprising that it was just brand like this. They also, in previous usage, I actually tried to use this about a year and a half ago, and for whatever reason, I could not get it installed on my computer. I don't know why, and it took, it was very frustrating, but within the span of a year, they got it like extremely stable. Um, yeah, so it's awesome. That's about it. <laughs> um, I believe no. Oh, that's interesting. It might be, though. It was. Let me see. So I installed it through um, this thing called Brew, which Homebrew, which is on, um, okay. which is on uh, Mac OS X. Yes. And it's just like one thing to do it. But I've also had it compiled. Whoa. How did I do that? You can get... Uh, oh. Uh, it's one of the packages, uh, Postgres packages and RPMs and, De uh, and Debian, or Debs. So yeah, it uses the copy command to do a lot of the stuff. Um, one thing is, is it puts it in its own schema. It doesn't put it in the public schema. So you generally, what you have to do is drop the public schema, then re-import the other schema mm -hmm. and rename it. But basically, yeah, this is, this is kind of the interesting thing too, is it gives you just enough, like, it might, like, I know it breaks the Unix philosophy to give you data when you do this type of stuff, but when you're importing on, the, like, a billion records, you kind of want to know, you want something back. You just don't want to see nothing. Mm -hmm. And having these types of tables is also really useful, especially in the CSV format. It basically tells you everything that was created within the thing, gives you complete statistical analysis of the import, which is, like, really useful when you're, like, Wait, why did X not do right? Yes, Chris? Did you have any cases where you had bad data that it had to throw out? No. And, uh, because I, if I remember, this is, there's, some inter there's interesting stuff in that case. No, um, I had no bad data ever, which was really surprising. Um, I, I had some issues where like char, um, not char, what are they called in Postgres? Varchar. Varchars were 
were stored instead of a number value, but that was usually because the CSV formatting was incorrect. Um, within that, you can basically say convert to um, into the, the correct format and things like that in a much more complex kind of configuration file, which is actually really useful is that you can, this isn't just command line, you can actually write a config file and have it load from that. So if you have to have like reproducible conversions a lot, it's really great. Um, yeah, it's it's really handy for what it can do. And if I suggest that you have it in your tool belt just to be able to like easily migrate between things into Postgres, which is amazing. It's now easy to install. The, the last time I played with this was probably five years ago, and it wasn't. Yeah, this, like, it seems to be in every major package distribution. Yeah. This is uh -huh. one of the, it's in the uh, Postgres uh, uh, utilities package. Yeah. And yes, it is Lisp. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. I'd say. So, yeah, we... there, there's another one, which I can't remember the name of, but it's another, I believe it's called MySQL to Postgres which is written in Ruby, which has the problem with these types of projects and why I really like PG Loader, um, these types of projects tend to be something a company picks up like five years ago and then maintains to a point to get their data done, open source it, and nobody ever does it. And maybe it'll be picked up by another company and forked and then taken a little bit more and that will be a little bit, <coughs> there's never something recent. and. I really like PG Loader's idea because the fact is we sometimes just need to import data and we need to import it into something better than a CSV file and PG Loader is really trying hard to do that. Um, you had a question? Yeah, it, is it taking like multiple CSVs and turning that into tables or they do um, CSV to one table? Yeah, so to do a CSV to one table, um, if you wanted to, you could have multiple CSVs and have basically a foreign key kind of connection between the two, if you had it something of that nature. Um, but yeah, you generally have to have some type of primary key going through it. So, Seneca? Yeah, so about the language thing, I just looked up the README. So, it actually has been rewritten a couple times. It was originally written in Tickle. Yes, by Jan. <laughs> then it rewritten in Python. And then rewritten in Lisp. <laughs> but it worked. Which is kind of the most important part of it. <laughs> one of the, one of the one of the cool things originally had to do with its handling of dodgy data. If you've got an error every five thousand records, well, you don't want to load one record at a time. You want to ramp it up. But that essentially it would it would ramp up the the rate of, of load oh let's one record at a time and then increase okay now we're up to a thousand records at a time kaboom you hit a bad record we'll have to go back and load the 700 that failed so yeah i had that uh, in the previous version about a year ago ish and it was largely because they didn't do the the json data field yet in it which I think was just too early for MySQL as well as Postgres at the time. <laughs> um, now it fully supports it. It actually does, there's a couple issues where like, it makes sensible defaults, which is understandable in those types of scenarios, but sometimes you want to in custom and hmm. then you can go into kind of make it to the config a little bit better. Yeah. MySQL does have a lot of strange SQLisms that they seem to, to I wouldn't say steal, but borrow from Oracle. Um, mm -hmm. Substring is a very popular thing that doesn't really seem to be well made in Postgres, but it also is one of those things where I wonder if it should be. Should exist. Yeah, like <laughs> there, uh, the, the code base I was working with was this, this PHP application that was, it, it was very interesting how it was written and um, they definitely took it like, um, one example is they had a region table, which basically one region could ha could have a parent region, and they tried to do, um, it's called MPTT, which I believe is an acronym. And um, <laughs> basically they were, they were doing you selects don't. within selects within selects within selects within selects, nine down, and bringing it up, and then doing the substring replace so that it displayed correctly into the data, <laughs> which was, it was a unique way of handling that that problem, but it also meant that like I had to really think about how am I going to translate this over to Postgres, where there isn't those types of 
fun things, I guess, would be a thing. So, yeah. Any other questions? Hmm. Can you, oh, you mean like? Can you keep running your MySQL database and have it going into Postgres and then? Hmm. Yeah, if it's continuous, I'm, that should be possible. Yeah, I'm just trying to think about that. Does Postgres, what, the thing Sloney is using to do replication, they're using the logging, right? Is that how it works? No, it's using, it, no, it uses track. No, Sloney uses triggers on the tables to capture when changes are made. I wonder if it's it's a possibility to do that in MySQL, and then every time a change is made, just migrate over the data. Yes, it's going to fall somewhere between you have to detect when the changes are on the source versus you try and reload and have some kind of a semantic to say, well, here's a... There were a million records yesterday. There's a mi uh, there's a million one hundred thousand today. Well, that means there were a hundred and there were a hundred thousand that got dropped, two hundred thousand that got added, and fifty thousand that got modified. Yeah. And we have to do those uh, those changes. Um, um, yeah, and it might break. not clear. In theory, you could just cat the MySQL log into uh, a PG. Uh, PG loader, yeah, and basically because PG loader can uh, can pull things off of standard uh, standard input, yeah. So when something goes into the log in MySQL, uh, it will immediately be uh, also be piped into PG loader. Um, yeah, you know what? I just took a look at what they mean by continuous migration. They don't mean uh, replicating across different database servers. What they mean is you're preparing for a migration and you can do multiple test migrations repeatedly before the final migration. Oh, okay. Yeah, huh. it's not continuous. That's <laughs> so you can do continuous integration stuff testing your migration yeah. and use this as one of the tools. Hmm. Huh. It does fail on some fancier things like multi-tenant database stuff, but other than that, it's fine. So I'm getting the roll-up signal, and if there's no more questions, great. Thank you very much. Awesome.